Imagine you had a really bad headache and a cold, and you decided you had to go and see a few doctors about this. After visiting three different doctors, they asked you the right questions, they did the tests they wanted to do, and then one of them told you it was just the flu, the second one said you had malaria, and the last one said you had a brain tumour. Sounds a bit far-fetched, doesn't it? You might be thinking this could never happen, probably should never happen. However, this is analogous to what might happen if instead of a fever and a cold, you, had, you were suffering from symptoms of low mood, anxiety, or feeling suicidal. In other words, if you were suffering from mental health difficulties rather than physical health difficulties. And to try and understand why this is, let's look at what a mental health diagnosis represents. So imagine you had your fever, headache, and vomiting. You went to a doctor, they did a blood test, they said you had malaria. And this diagnosis or label of malaria gives you information about the cause, in this case, the Plasmodium virus, which you probably caught from a mosquito bite. So we have symptoms, you get a diagnosis, and the diagnosis gives you information about the cause, which is then what is treated, or the why. It gives you information about why you're suffering from these symptoms. Diagnosis in mental ill health don't give you any information about the cause. They're very circular. Why are you suffering from low mood, hopeless and tired? Because I'm depressed. Why are you depressed? Because I'm feeling low mood, hopeless and tired. So we have all these different diagnoses in mental ill health and they don't give us any information about cause. What they do do is they give a description for a set of symptoms you might be struggling with. To see where these sets of, or where these sets of symptoms are described and assigned to these different diagnoses, let's take a look at the classification systems. So here are examples of various different mental health disorders, some more common than others. And the most common or widely used classification systems where sets of symptoms are assigned to these specific diagnoses are the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association and the ICD that is developed by the World Health Organization. And essentially what these enormous books give us information, or now websites, give us information on is they give a detailed profile of the sorts of symptoms and the severity of symptoms which you should be suffering from to be given a certain diagnosis. Now you might be wondering, why do these diagnoses not give us any information about the why? And this is where my research sits. So I am interested in the development of mental health problems, but also understanding the risk and protective factors and the causes of mental health problems. And for the most part, scientists, or us researchers, study mental health problems in the silos that correspond to these different diagnoses. So some people study depression, others study schizophrenia, and so on. But when we take a step back and we try to look at what we've discovered about the possibly unique risk factors, biomarkers and causes of these different disorders, what we find is there aren't any. So for the most part, the risk factors that we've identified, so for example, let's take suffering from abuse, this could be the form of either child maltreatment, sexual abuse or being bullied, these are all risk factors for most mental health problems. Similarly, stress, whether in the form of poverty or work stress or, you know, experiencing war or violence are again all risk factors for several mental health problems. Similarly with biomarkers, we have nothing in the blood or the brain, like we can't do a blood test to tell you you have depression, at least not yet. So if we know nothing or we don't have specific causes or risk factors that tell us about these disorders and they're just descriptions of symptoms, then surely shouldn't we be understanding or looking at how these symptoms relate to each other more closely? So in the last couple of years, this is where my research has taken me, from trying to understand risk factors and causes to looking at the symptoms more closely. Let's take an example. Here we have some symptoms of depression with the Ds next to them and some symptoms of anxiety with the As next to them. These are common symptoms of depression and anxiety. And let's try and imagine what these symptoms would look like in their relationship to each other in space. So if you could imagine these symptoms as nodes in a network, you have, you'd expect them as distinct separate disorders to form two different clusters in space. 
you would expect some symptoms to be related more strongly to each other than others. So the thickness of the lines here is giving an indication of the strength of the symptoms. So for example, feeling um, very tired and not sleeping well, you could imagine as more closely related than loss of pleasure. And you could argue that like in physical health, how, for example, hypertension, diabetes and obesity are still related, although they're different things, that some symptoms of depression and anxiety are probably related. Logically, this probably makes sense. However, when we look at actual data, this is what we find. First of all, there's no clustering in space, so there's no two separate clusters. And even if you look closely at this one single cluster and you try to say, are all the depression symptoms on one side and all the anxiety on the other, they're not. It's just a jumble of symptoms. And obviously in science, we try to replicate our findings. We try to study this in various ways. So in my particular research group, we looked at, looked at this at various different ages. So the, the rationale was maybe this changes as children develop into adults. Other people have looked at them in adults and we find the same thing. Depression and anxiety do not cluster separately in space. Then you might argue these are mainly general population samples. By this I mean it's a group of um, the population across the board. So most people will have low to moderate symptoms and there'll be a small proportion that has severe symptoms. And that maybe if we actually looked at this in a clinical sample, that is individuals actually receiving mental health support for this, these problems, we wouldn't see this picture. So we went and looked at around 38,000 individuals who had these symptom data for mental health services and still it's one cluster. So this is important because when we diagnose somebody with a particular disorder, that gives information to whoever decides to treat them about how best to treat them. So if you had the, a diagnosis of depression, the guidelines or the sort of recommended treatments are different than if you had anxiety or if you had psychosis and so on. This is also a problem because depression and anxiety are two of the most common mental health disorders at the moment. Depression alone is one of the leading causes of disease burden worldwide. And depression and anxiety together are already the leading cause of disease burden in countries like the UK. So to understand the scale of the mental health problems in the world and why better classifying them is important, let's look at the global disease burden. So this is the disease burden. This is a big black box of all the disease burden in our lives. Across the bottom we have age, so across our lives there's different problems that cause the most disease burden. And in this big black box, we have everything. Infectious diseases like malaria and HIV, non-infectious diseases like phys and physical health problems like diabetes and cancer, and mental health problems as well. And this is the disease burden across our lives that mental health account or mental ill health accounts for. So it's a su substantial proportion. And if you think about people in this room, most of us are in our 20s and 30s. In our 20s and 30s, about a third of the disease burden is because of mental illness. In the UK, one in six of us at any time are expected to be suffering from a mental health problem. And through our lives, or the lifetime expectancy of, pre of prevalence is almost half. So almost one in two of us will suffer from a mental health disorder at some point in our lives. So all of us here, will feel the impact of mental health problems, either because we will face them ourselves or because they will, somebody we love will suffer from mental health problems. So mental health problems have not only an enormous impact on the individuals who suffer from them, their families, wider society, they also have a much larger cost. So just to give you the estimate of the cost to the economy, just in the la so the most recent um, assessment is that in one year, the UK economy suffers up to 99 billion pounds cost to the economy due to mental illness. So just to reiterate that, in just one year, the cost to the UK economy of mental illness is 99 billion pounds. And this problem, it's not going away. So this is comparisons, with, so we've just finished analysis in 14 year olds just a few years ago, so 2014-15, compared to 14-year-olds just 10 years previously. And similarly, on the, my other side, you have 42-year-olds around 12 years apart. 
And in both cases, you can see the prevalence has increased substantially in just this fairly short period of time. It's about 6% in the 14-year-olds, so it goes from around a prevalence of 9% to 15%. And just to reiterate how, big, how much of a change this is, this, in just 10 years, is the equivalent of almost two more teenagers in every secondary school classroom suffering from more mental health problems than just 10 years before that. So the problem is not going away. What are we doing about it? So as researchers, we're making progress all the time. So going back to the classification systems, the classification systems that we currently use are not even a century old, and they're tweaked all the time. So you can see that we're on a, a few versions on for both these um, classification systems. But so far, the tweaks the, or the changes to the system tend to be in the form of tweaks. So we adjust the system, we change, we create a few new diagnoses, a few diagnoses get taken away. But there's growing consensus based on the sorts of information I gave you earlier that maybe we need a system overhaul instead of trying to tweak a system that's not really working optimally. And this has consequences for how we study both causes of mental illness but also how we try and understand treatments. Because for the most part, we try and understand the causes and treatment based on these diagnostic classification systems. That doesn't have to be the case, but that's how it's currently done. So we try to understand the causes for depression. We try to understand the best treatment for depression. And the other issue here is also about prevention. So when we try to focus on causes of, and treatment of specific disorders, however, if the risk factors and causes are common across most disorders, in terms of focusing on prevention, actually it makes sense to focus on prevention for mental illness more broadly speaking than specific mental health problems. So in, I'm just going to talk about two problems or things that are preventing us, I think, from making the progress we need to make with this sort of huge public health issue. The first one is stigma. Mental ill health still has a large stigma associated with it. Uh, this ranges from people not believing it's real illness to just the sort of social stigma that people face when they sort of experience mental health problems or talk about it. And stigma has been improving, so the attitudes towards mental illness in the last few decades have phenomenally improved. However, it's still a problem. And if you don't believe it's still a problem, let's just think about an example. You're feeling really bad and you don't want to get out of bed one day. And that's because you have the flu. You're quite happy to ring your colleagues and say, I have the flu, don't want to come into work today. But imagine you were feeling really bad and didn't want to get out of bed because you just didn't, you were feeling really anxious and didn't want to see anybody that day. People would probably have more qualms about ringing their colleagues or think twice before ringing their colleagues and saying, actually, can I have a, I'm feeling, can I have a mental ill health day, please? But the other big problem is investment. So this is how much we invest in mental illness combined. So all mental illnesses combined compared to in this case, just a comparison is cancer and dementia. To take the bigger picture of all health research funding in the UK, if this is all the health research funding in the UK, the tiny red sliver you see there is how much we spend on all mental ill health research. So contrast this with what we saw earlier. This is a substantial cause of disease burden. It has enormous cost to the economy. It affects most of us at some point in our lives, but we do very little about it. And herein lies the real paradox. Mental ill health is a staggering public health problem and is only increasing. And as a society, we're doing staggeringly little to improve our understanding, the prevention and treatment of this big public health problem. So I'd like to leave you on the question, what are we going to do about it?